Hello, this is the Ralph Bivens Project, and I'm Ralph Bivens. We're here today to talk about growth. We're going to talk about change. We're going to talk about new buildings, new projects, and we're going to talk about the workplace. And it's a big issue right now because so many people, including our guests that are today, Dean Strombaum, we're, we're working from home uh, during during the COVID thing, and it's but it's going to get better. And there's a lot of hope there. We've seen some companies recently, this is in the last day or two, we've seen some big companies like Salesforce, which is the main tenant of a huge skyscraper that Heinz built in San Francisco, say, well, we, we're, we're really not going to require too much coming into the office anymore. Um, there are other companies taking different approaches, but they have to figure it out now because um, the vaccine is given being given and we've uh, but but there's changes in the way people work and where they work so we're lucky today to have dean strombaum from gensler which is one of the biggest architecture firms in the world he's a principal there strategy leader and he's um you know done a tremendous amount of work uh, 50 million feet or something over the years that he's uh, worked on and designed and but his company Gensler has talked to a lot of companies they talk to a lot of people that work in office space they talk to managers they talk to guys at lease space all these things and they have a tremendous amount of of data on that and so, and some answers about where we're going what's what it's going to be like when everybody starts going back to work how much they will go back to work how often they'll go back to work and what it's going to look like, where the space is going to be like, how the buildings need to change inside and out to make it a better place to work in the post COVID era, which we hope will come soon. So Dean, uh, what about the workplace of the future? What, <laughs> what are you, what are your thoughts there? I know you wrote a piece recently, but what are your thoughts about uh, where we're going? Well, you know, I think the, the workplace of the future is going to be uh, different for uh, s different companies, different individuals, and uh, how it all shakes out is, is certainly yet to be figured out. But, um, you know, we have done quite a bit of research um, over the last 10 years about uh, the workplace and, and what people like to see in the workplace, their expectations, and that sort of ramped up a lot during the last 10 months while we've been in this pandemic mode and, and our research that is um so you know trying to find out what is good about working from home what's not so good and and ultimately what is that future workplace going to be like and um so we found we have found through our research that some people have been tremendously productive at home working from home and away from the office uh, conversely, when we talk to people that are working at the office, whether they never left or they've come back to the office, they they submit that they're most productive at the office. So it's it's kind of a conundrum. But uh, I would submit that it's it kind of depends on what kind of work you're doing, your role in the company, and whether you're doing more collaborative teamwork based um, projects or or whether you're more uh, working in an individual focused mode. So um, it's kind of all over the map at, at this moment. And what we're, we're suggesting is that there should be some sort of hybrid approach. Uh, ideally, employees should have the, the choice and the freedom to, to work where they're most productive for whatever tasks they're doing. So uh, before people went away uh, during the pandemic and worked at home, uh, we were strong advocates for uh, allowing people to move throughout the office and find the right setting for the right work. And so if anything, it's it's just expanded more uh, to this ability to work not only at the office per se, but uh, at home or some other third place for that matter. So, so people, you think a lot of companies are going to do the hybrid where you work from the office some days, you work from home some days, and, you know, you're local. Starbucks or at a co-working place someday. You know? Well, I, th I think that that would be ideal. I mean, quite honestly, the other thing we found in our 
in our um, research is that only about 20% of employees across the country feel like they really have that choice to, to work where they want to work. Um, and most, yeah, all, about 80% feel like somebody else is going to make that decision for them, whether they're allowed to work at, at, at home or somewhere else, or whether they'll be required to come back to the office. So, um, you know, I think that kind of speaks to different corporate cultures um, and, uh, and what companies see of most benefit to the company um, and may or may not be good for the, for the individual. But uh, for those that, that uh, do feel like they have that choice, that 20% of the total uh, in our survey, uh, they they are looking forward to some hybrid hybrid approach. So, what's a what? Uh, okay, the new office space going forward. When people go back to work, if as we move along and some of these changes get made to the interior of buildings, what what will look differently? What or can the, the typical office worker see differently in? The next year or two than they have been in the past well you know i think um it's been recognized through our research and other people's research um, that the office is highly effective for collaborative needs and so uh, people coming together and working together on projects um, and building that company culture those are the reasons why you might want to spend time at the office. Um, we've also found that uh, creativity, innovation, socializing, those are attributes that, that need to be emphasized. So um, certainly this, this new office, uh, in my mind, should have uh, a lot of places, both formal and informal, for gathering, and both for, for meeting spaces and, and collaboration in that regard, but also for socializing. So I think that's what people like to come into the office for. Um, so that might lead some people to say, well, the office of the future should be only for that. Um, if you need to come in for a meeting or for some other event, then that's a reason to come. But maybe uh, it doesn't provide those individual workspaces that people working from home would argue that are better done at home. Um, I don't personally feel that way. I, I feel that the way people work uh, is a very fluid um, way of, of, of getting through the day. And sometimes you're moving from collaboration into socializing, into learning, into focus, uh, these different work modes throughout the day. And there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a fluidity to that uh, work day that you can't just say we're only going to do this kind of work in this area and another kind of work in another area. Right, right. It's a, and I keep thinking about the, the, you know, a young person getting a, you know, starting in a new company, if they've done that, if they graduated, you know, last May, trying to get a job and then you're trying to break into a new company, you don't know anybody other than what you see on Zoom. Uh, that, that seems pretty tough road to hoe yeah. for a new yeah. employee, you know. That'd be real tough. The, uh... You know, I, when we first went into this working from home mode, uh, my I was thinking that the younger generations, uh, uh, millennials and Gen Zs, would be the ones that would thrive in this kind of environment because they're so technology savvy. Um, and uh, actually, what we found is that those are the generations that most want to come back to the office mm -hmm. uh, when we started thinking about that, why that might be, it, it became clear that it is, is about building your career and that these people have entered the workforce in order to build, a, build this career, make sure that uh, people know that they're capable uh, of doing great things, all the mentoring and sponsoring that, that the more senior people in the office have, have to offer them. That's, that's why they want to come to the office. So. On the flip side of that, uh, older people like like myself uh, want to come back to the office as well, and that's really to to do that mentoring and 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 helping the next the next generation along. Um, what we found is that those people in the middle who are very comfortable with their with where they are in their career, they know what they're doing. 
they are actually the ones that are that are most comfortable working at home. They they can avoid to commute. They can <laughs> exactly. go to work and be at work. And you know, in some ways, the avoiding the commute is much yeah. more productive. Oh, your the commuting is a big factor in in all of this. That uh, um, you know, if you've got a long commute and and you've come to realize that you're fairly productive at home. Uh, the, the idea of, of spending two hours on, of your day driving back and forth to the office isn't isn't so appealing. One of the things you wrote in your your article, um, if I can quote this one sentence, it's it's a big topic. Given the fact that significantly fewer employees will be coming to the office every day in this new flexible hybrid work approach, the office won't need to be nearly as large as it once was. Um, if you own office buildings, um, <laughs> if you lease office space, that's probably not the thing you want to be reading. And, hey, yeah. These yeah. companies that had occupied 100,000 feet, they had occupied five floors, maybe they only need two now or something. Mm -hmm. Is that, uh, that not bad for landlords and the building? <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I think I think landlords and building owners um, do do recognize there's going to be a need for workplace. Um, the the challenge that they're going to have is is how do you attract tenants to their buildings and what makes their buildings unique and more aligned with perhaps the way people are going to be working. So this is a a, a personal belief of mine that uh, that when people come back to the office, uh, we're going to be be doing a certain amount of social distancing, and that would suggest that people spread out and there's more square feet per person. Yes. Um, but I believe that over time, uh, that need is going to diminish. Um, I think what people are looking for is that flexibility in the workplace and in the office building common areas that you can swift, that you can quickly shift gears um, when a pandemic mode arises, because, you know, now that we've experienced this, I don't think anybody believes that we're not going to have one of these again. So now it's a question of what are we going to be, how can we quickly get into this, uh, you know, alternative mode of working. Um, but I think in the, in the long run, uh, this shift, uh, people realizing that they are able to work at home, at least to some degree, that is going to kind of change the way we look at, at the workplace. Uh, you know. oh. I guess uh, the other thing, you know, that's happened recently at um, Gensler itself, I, I believe you've been in the Pennzoil place, right, for many years and, and you've moved your own office and designed it and it's new I and mean, you're, you're on the cutting edge on some of this. Uh, tell me about your move and well, the yeah. Have you actually moved folks yet, or they haven't well, come <laughs> So, so we, Houston office. That's my question. What happened? Yeah. Where are you going to be? So we uh, we did move from Pennzoil Place to to Houston Center um, uh, back in January of 2020. Um, so uh, just over a year ago, and then uh, beginning of March, we we moved out of to Houston Center and, and went home. We're still all working from home. Um, so our office there at Houston Center, although is brand new and uh, an exciting place to be, uh, nobody's working there right now. Um, but I think it was interesting as I was uh, mulling over this office of the future idea and, and what, what it might be like, I came to realize that the things that I was describing that should be in this new office are exactly what we built into our office. Uh, we have uh, two floors of space, and they were former uh, common building common areas at, at Houston Center. What what we were what they refer to as levels P two and P three, um, and they looked into the, the general concourse level P one, uh, and and so it's we feel like we're almost part of the of the public realm uh, in the building with no physical divider between our space and and the public space um, 
Mm-hmm. And um, so the f- the first of our two floors, P2, is our is our reception area, and it is primarily uh, 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 collaboration and socializing space. Mm-hmm. So we have our reception area. We have a, a big fancy coffee bar, um, and, and we have lounge areas uh, and meeting spaces, both formal and informal, on that floor. Uh, our library or our resource center is also on that floor. And there's a little bit of uh, individual workspace on, on that floor as well. Uh, probably, I don't know, maybe 15, 20% of the floor is, is individual workspace. Uh, the second floor, uh, P3, is really is really our workhorse floor. And that's where we have is, is all... Uh, individual and team workspaces uh, for our employees. So, um, what I was, what I was sort of postulating was that this P two level, the, the first floor, is more like what I think the office of the future is going to be because it's a place where people want to go. They can meet with uh, not only fellow employees or colleagues, but also with clients and and consultants and vendors and everybody else we meet with. And it's a very social engaging floor with the resource center there, with meeting spaces, with individual workspaces. Uh, but the focus of it is is around collaboration and, and socializing. So uh, I'm very excited about with the thought of getting, getting to the office because uh, I, I do think it, it represents at least what I think is the right move. Um, and then uh, and see how how it works long term. I will say that the that the building spaces are a big part of that office of the future as well. We have a a uh, a tenant co working space directly below our space that we look into on this level P one uh, that uh, is open to all tenants in the building. And and I think from an amenity standpoint, that's one of the smart things that Brookfield did in the repositioning. Um, along with that, there's there's a fitness center that's free and open to all tenants in the complex, as well as a, a very large conference center. Um, so you can have up to 300 people meeting in one place. And these are spaces that are adjacent to ours, um, and mm-hmm. they're not part of our rent per se, or at least they're not part of our, our tenant lease space, uh, but they're available to us uh, as an amenity uh, within the complex, and then, and then the, so, and then the the other advantage of of Houston Center and the repositioning is is an abundance of outdoor spaces and that connection to uh, park shops, which is going to be renovated, um, you know, in the next several months. That would be good. The uh, Houston Center, I, I, you know, if you're new to Houston, it, 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 what Gensler Architecture did, they were in Pennzoil Place, which was closer to the theater, kind of on the theater district, kind of on the the, the northwest side of town, and, and they moved to Houston Center, which was, I believe it's a four-building complex. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're kind of on McKinney, San Jacinto, Caroline Streets, and they, they bought it, I believe, uh, Three years ago, for eight hundred and seventy-five million dollars, mm-hmm. major transaction. The problem is, is you know, it's built in, in the seventies, in the eighties. I think there may have been one in the eighties or something, but a long time ago. And it needed, and it's part of this whole thing that's happening in downtown Houston, where you have, and across the nation, where you have older office buildings that they've got to keep up with what are the new trends, what's being built new, what what is Heinz building there on Texas Avenue. Mm-hmm. That's their competition now. If Skanska moves forward with this, what is it, 1550 Green, a little bit closer right. to the, right. the, over there by Discovery Green, what happened, what's going to happen with all this? Uh, they've got to stay competitive. So right now, millions and millions of dollars uh, Hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent to upgrade these older buildings to keep them in class A space. It's very competitive. You know, the, the tenants are looking for everything. So Brookfield bought these buildings and they said, 
we've got to do, and they just completed another downtown complex called the Allen Center several buildings. And they're working, they've worked really hard on this and they've just completed it, they say, and uh, um, at least uh, two of the first buildings there. And you know, Gensler was involved in that. And um, so it's, uh, I haven't been and see the totally finished product, but you know, I've, I've uh, seen the rendering, seen the pictures and uh, they did a lot of great things like uh, the exterior outside the building, kind of been a big lawn and kind of a berm or something like, you know, uh, you'd see on a battlefield to keep people out, you know, <laughs> they, yeah. but they came in, um, you know, Clark Condon, uh, landscape architecture also worked with you on this project, I believe, right. you know, they kind of flattened some of these areas out, made them usable, made lawns that people can go sit at and be at and enjoy and have their, instead of a place that's just, there with not really usable because of the you know the hill to it and everything <laughs> but yeah it, it, uh, so this is a huge trend to spend these millions of dollars to upgrade these buildings and uh, we will probably see some more and also uh you know dean you just mentioned that you know the park shops which um uh come kind of right near the, the four seasons hotel um uh, that's been there. It's been, you know, tough, tough retail. You know, it's uh, the building was uh, initially designed with, you know, this big, humongous, impenetrable type fortress that right. no windows and stuff. And, but, you know, inside they had shops and things like, you know, a bookstore and wooden stores, apparel on the first, and then a big, humongous food court uh, where they had lunchtime during the the week you know thousands of people um, office workers there er every day and then always been a challenge to do something to to expand that i mean ed wolf worked on it everybody's worked on it it's a it is a tough nut to crack and uh, mm -hmm. a tough 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 market what can you do with the uh, you know, it's for Houston, this kind of partial, re it's the retail element there. And how do you, um, what do you do next with that? Well, I think that that's really been the challenge or one of the challenges with the complex in general. Um, you recall, I'm sure when Texas Eastern bought up those, I think 32 blocks on the east side of downtown, they had this grand vision uh, that was going to, have these elevated sky sky bridges between all the buildings uh, there was a tram that uh, you that take you from your par your car which was parked on the other side of 59 uh, swing you into your office building and then you'd you'd go do your working and shopping and entertainment and everything else downtown all above the street level mm -hmm. um, you know as we've learned over the years the, the you know those they got a few of those buildings built and and that's what we know of houston center today and then the rest of it um, has become discovery green the convention center all of all of that and the hotels that was all part of the the grand plan uh way back then um so the challenge has been is how do you uh connect these buildings to the street level because we've learned since then that that's what we need to do both to to make these buildings attractive for employees and tenants but also for the public and and it's that connection to the street level that's vitally important the unique thing about houston center is that brookfield owns properties on both sides of the street um, and so we were able to um, remove one of the lanes of traffic on mckinney um uh raise those street levels up and and make sort of this seamless landscape from building edge to building edge across the street so it becomes a, a more of a, a district and it's unique in that matter i mean there, this is the only place downtown where a building owner owns both sides of the street and we can we would actually able to create that that new domain um so that that became the the 
the challenge for phase one of getting that connection to the street on the north side of McKinney. And now we're, we're looking at how do we, how do we deal that, deal with that on, on the retail side, on the south side of McKinney, um, building that connection, a new connection from street level seamlessly up to that uh, shopping center uh, on the second and third floor above the parking podium and break down that fortress like feeling that that you see or that you have when you when you look at that um so that's what that's what we're we're working on today the um the tenant mix is going to be completely different um in in the in the park shops over time and brookfield's uh national retail group is is looking at new anchors um and and it's going to be a, a place i think People are going to be very excited about going to not only the the office workers in the in the area, but also we we hope that this whole district is something that becomes revitalized and uh, a place of people want to go before or after work and on weekends mm -hmm. and sort of leveraging off of Discovery Green. Um, that we, yeah, it's it's just two two blocks away and and it's a. Uh, so I think, you know, if we've got some dynamic food and beverage office offerings there and maybe some entertain, entertainment anchors, um, this whole part of town will will be completely different than it was just a few short years ago. Well, uh, I think there's, uh, you know, you're also involved in another important project, um, the ION, um, which is done by rice management which handles the endowment for rice university um and i believe it's 288,000 square feet i believe it's 4600 block of maine in midtown right. south of downtown near wheeler uh pretty close to, to montrose and, and um you know, richmond ave uh, avenue but it's a 1939 sears store that's what it was originally multi-story uh I believe it's three stories up and in the basement, you know, mm -hmm. but just that was that's a total challenge. And then Rice is going to make it into, I guess it's, it's kind of a, you know, kind of a business incubator and, and have that aspect to it and to help startups get plugged in and to help us help Houston develop uh, uh, some technology firms and, and, and firms that come out the ideas from the university kind of translate into the marketplace mm -hmm. we have some, you know i believe microsoft is lease space there and uh, you know chevron of all uh, chevron technology mm -hmm. some space there they this is the weirdest thing i've been covering real estate for a few decades their press release and they wouldn't even answer the question well, so how much space did you, you did you lease? You know, like, I've never gotten a press like we lease space, but it won't say how many square. <laughs> so I, I've still that's still my quest <laughs> to um, get Chevron to come clean and say, well, I can't understand what's your motivation for uh, uh -huh. not telling the media, you know, the exact size of that space. But that's that aside. It's a uh, you know, hey, you know, a lot of people bought clothes there. And, and you're in that big, big building. Uh, Art Deco cools some stuff that re remain and was saved to have that that 1939 look, which, which I think it was, you know, covered up and bastardized in some unfortunate thing in the 60s. But there's still some left, and that was peeled back. Mm -hmm. uh, it's looking pretty good from the outside, but but you think about the inside, big old time department store with the huge department store all in one building and you know it's uh these very separate levels and with a lot of how do you you know fluorescent lights all over the place <laughs> not much way to uh, i guess you know the only point of entry is is it from the escalator it was where it was you know, and so that was it um so what can you do with that to, if you're going to transform it into these smaller spaces that be kind of used for office use and things of that nature and co-working and stuff, how do you transform these big, 
huge. I don't know what the floor plates are, but you know, say they're 60,000, uh, but they're big. How do you transform that old, old store into something that's cool? Yeah, I think the, the, the key there is, is uh, getting daylight into those spaces. And, and that's true with the, a lot of these old, older, older buildings, large floor plates. Um, and that one in spe specifically, uh, uh, we've opened up large, large holes on, on the existing floors, allowing daylight to come all the way through the building into the, into the basement. And, uh, they had a, 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 a lighting, a light, design lighting designer that that helped with that to under to make sure that that light was cast as broadly as possible but without creating glare so that's that's part of it is just opening up large uh, dark floor plates um, to get light in from above and i've been then on in particular on the ion uh, it's for anybody that's seen it uh, there's a whole new addition to that a couple of floors of of floor to ceiling glass on top of the building uh the that what was the sears store and so uh, it's really a transformative project and although the the bones of it are the the sears store uh you'd be hard pressed if you didn't know that that was the sears store to, to look at it today and say uh and it's it's an, i think it's a beautiful building um, um but it has it's transformed completely to to what it what it was um, so that's, I think, but it's a good, a good example of, of using the stock that's there, um, that's worth saving, um, and not simply tearing things down because they don't serve the particular purpose any longer, but, you know, trying to find a way to, to make them work. And, and I think that that particular district, again, over time, it, it's going to just get better and better and better, uh, you know, rice management, uh, uh, owns a, a lot of land in that area. It's sort of that crossroads of the city, and some for in some respects, it's kind of halfway between downtown and the medical center. And then mm -hmm. the east west, it's you know University of Houston out at one end, and and the gallery at the other. And um, you know a lot of our transportation crosses right there. Um, and um, and so you know I think the Ion is sort of the first project catalyst um, but uh, the plans for those whatever nine blocks or whatever it is they're, they're really they're really uh, far reaching and I think uh, over time that that's really going to be a, a serious new hub for technology it would be fantastic if that it, how this turns out would be it, it could be a great thing it could really be a great thing I, I do you know being, uh, you know, I would say my criticism of the area is that the way that the ad grade, you know, metro rail is laid out, that is probably the most confusing. <laughs> <laughs> if you're coming up, if you're coming up Main Street and you get there, and, oh, it, and, and the train curves and goes, it's like, no, yeah. I keep thinking, you know, I think back, hey, maybe Texas Eastern had their act together <laughs> to separate all that you know you know really every time i drive by there i think why did we build these things at grade why didn't we get them up and you know build a monorail or some type of elevated rail that would have been somewhat better wouldn't have disrupted traffic wouldn't have been so dangerous you know that we know that from my accidents have happened there that rice professor uh, <coughs> On the rice professor on a bicycle mm -hmm. going to the campus, uh, he got hit by the train. It was a fatal accident. That was a horrible thing. Um, but that, that that's uh, you know it's one thing I regret that about the city that we I think there was a, a funding deal, so of course we compromised and took the cheap way out. Yeah, but, but it would have been great to have have that great separation and not to. But that is the most, I don't know what can be done. But if that, that is a crazy, crazy metro rail street. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it does, it does at least seem like it's, it was a series of compromises that uh, uh, led to what, what we have there. Well, I just hope Houston of the future, <laughs> we don't make the compromises and yeah. 
we don't do things. We, we save these assets, like you said, save the Sears asset and, uh, and make something out of it. And, 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 and like we, when we had the, you know, we had the, the Katie Freeway, we had all that right away there with the, the train line was right there next to the freeway. Perfect shot. Mm-hmm. And we got commuter rail, boom, get people out to the, the suburbs without getting tires onto the freeway. And, you know, the, the leadership at that time was say, oh, no, let's make the freeway wider. So now it's the widest freeway <laughs> in the world, you know. Yeah. Like, what a mistake. That's one of the huge yeah. mistakes our forefathers of the city made. Yeah. And, you know, can we think and not, not compromising, we stop it. You know, and I feel like sometimes we just take, it just goes by compromise. Let's find the cheapest way out. We can't spend that much money to do it right. Sometimes let's just do nothing rather than, you know, yeah. make a compromise and do stuff wrong. Well, you, you've, you've written in, in your book, Ralph, about the, the bold nature of Houstonians from yesteryear that uh, we need, we need more of that today. It's that time. It's that time. <laughs> you know, we're at the crossroads in so many ways, you know, with yeah. it. Um, electric vehicles are coming on strong and, and, uh, you know, we've got a, a lot of our local economy here is and local jobs are based on people driving cars and pumping gas. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's the big thing there that we need to think about and, and get it right, you know, um, for our growth. And uh, we, when you, when you wrote about, uh, this whole post COVID occupancy question and using, you know, small, less office space going mm-hmm. forward. The companies may like to do that. Um, and we're also f- looking at this problem with the lack of expansion and, and contraction, actually. Mm-hmm. Energy companies, uh, one of our primary users of office space, those two things combined say, uh, we need to really uh, get busy and take this seriously. Yeah. And quit uh, not prioritizing it or using excuses to uh, you know, extinguish vision and to mm-hmm. uh, just not take the big chance. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's yeah. a time for reinvention. Um, and, uh, and, you know, whether that's office space or older buildings or transportation, uh, any of these things, this, this is, this is the time and the future is changing rapidly. Um, and kind of, we need to get on board with some, some bold action plans, uh, that set, set, uh, our, our, our projects ourselves, our, and our, and our city apart from, from others. So I would agree. Dean Strombaum from Ginsler. Thanks for sharing with us today. Thanks for thinking. Thanks for being one of the good guys when you're out there <laughs> in places better than they, they were. All right. so, um, that's, that's the goal. Thank you. Cool. We'll uh, hope, to, hope to have you back sometime. And uh, thanks All right. for being a part of this. All right. Thank you very much, Rob. Have a good day.